Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the first of our Euromarine Science for Excite webinar series. We are thrilled to have you here today with us. Um, my name is Emma Bello Gomez, and I am the executive director of um, Euromarine Network. Um, I would like to express a, a special thanks to the members of uh, Euromarine Science Forest Site Working Group, Isabel Sousa Pinto, Marcos Pelo, Joseph Luis Pellegri, uh, Cosimo Solidoro and Diana Lopez, as well as to Euromarine uh, Project Manager Irina Pazoglu uh, for organizing uh, the first of this webinar series. And also a warm thank you to our speakers, uh, Tom Oliver, Gabriela Nuri Baron, and Jordi Pichem, for agreeing uh, to be here today for an exciting uh, debate on ocean science, arts, and philosophy in the information era. Before we start, I would like to give you a very, very brief introduction about the um, Euromarine Network and the context uh, for us to organize in this webinar series. So Euromarine Network was born in 2014, and um, we are a member-based interdisciplinary and collaborative network of European marine uh, organizations and research institutes. Uh, we have uh, currently over 55 members from 22 countries, not only from Europe, but also worldwide. Our mission is to support the identification and the initial development of important emerging scientific topics or issues uh, and associated methodologies in marine science, as well as to foster new services relevant for the marine scientific community. And we do that by creating and facilitating funding, uh, training, uh, networking, and other opportunities for researchers and organizations working in marine research. Over the last 10 years, we have supported uh, our researchers uh, by providing uh, over 1.5 million uh, euros to fund our uh, activities that ranges from the organization of forest site workshops uh, to training and capacity building for early career researchers. And now, as we reach our 10 year anniversary, we are reviewing our research priorities for the future. And it is in this, in this context um, that we are now organizing the Euromarine Science, uh, Euro Science for a Site webinar series. Our aim is to have a place to steer discussions and inspire thought-provoking debates that will help us define our priorities for marine research in the next period of the network. Uh, we are launching this webinar series with the topic ocean science, art, and philosophy in the information era. And finally, if you want to keep updated uh, with uh, the activities of our network, uh, you can follow us through our social media or subscribe to our newsletter. And without uh, further delay, I would like to give the floor to Joseph Luis uh, Pellegri, that is going to be our, moder uh, our moderator today. Uh, thank you very much again for joining us today, and uh, I hope you will enjoy the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. It's a real pleasure being here. I want to, to thank uh, all people at Euromarine that has helped so much to organize this and, and the speakers uh, that I will introduce shortly. Thanks all, all people joining for this uh, really exciting uh, uh, first webinar. This uh, uh, was uh, the... Let's see if it goes full page. Okay, I hope it's okay. Yes, this was the we we uh, the science foresight uh, working group. Uh, as Emma was saying, we we wanted to to identify our strategy for the future, and so we thought, okay, uh, we want to, to to not not conventional uh, issues. No, we don't want to talk or or explore. Uh, 
deeper things that are already there you know, in, in, in the portfolio. You know? Rather, we want to, to try to envision ourselves in, in, the, in the coming years. So, so that's, uh, we proposed several topics. And this was the, 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 the very first one that, that arose that we all agreed. You know? uh, we wanted to try to, to identify these possible futures. So, so we thought, okay, let's move uh, 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 first of all on our uh, uh, participation, our engagement with the ocean and with all living entities in the in this uh, living planet. No, uh, and that that engagement has to go through uh, non-conventional ways. And this is the the, the first uh, webinar. No, as Emma was saying, we'll have uh, another webinar uh, monthly for the next uh, coming months. And these are the tentative titles, and you will be posted uh, opportunely. No? The structure of today's seminar is we'll have a brief presentation by speakers. They will have uh, uh, 15 minutes, and, and uh, we'll try, uh, we ask them not to for questions and dialogue among them. And, and, uh, I will try to to moderate that, and, and then uh, we'll have a round of, of questions from the audience that uh, the, 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 you'll be able to choose the ones that, that you support wrap up. No? So as I was saying, no, this very first seminar comes from the the, the uh, the, the our big, uh, deep build of ocean is an essential element in the living earth, and as such, it's a participant of the future of of, of our planet and of the future of our species. No? And this is a time of of uh, uh, very fast uh, changes. In particular, uh, we know that uh, uh, robotics and artificial intelligence are changing how we are going to relate with among ourselves and with with nature in the future. No, so. Uh, this was one of the first issues we said, okay, let's try to, to explore how we can use this uh, artificial intelligence, not uh, as, a, as a goal, but rather as a tool toward a, a greater and deeper uh, growth of, of uh, individual, collective, uh, and, and uh, species growth. No, we envision our, our uh, great, great grandchildren with a very different perception of the wall around us. And, and this, uh, we know, we realize it's, it's both uh, supported by uh, bottom up, and, uh, and we are here because of that, no? and top down movements, and particularly the top down movements. In 2009, we had this declaration of harmony with nature by the United Nations, and United Nations have been behind this extraordinarily all these years. And the European Union in, in 2022, uh, started with this mission on, on Restore Our Ocean and Waters, that it's a specific mission uh, within all these contexts of, of Green Deal and the restoration uh, funds from the European Union. So uh, we, we do believe that, that this uh, harmonious evolution of Homo sapiens uh, uh, and possibly its subsistence as, as a species no? uh, in front of all these developments of robotics and so on, no? Uh, requ requires uh, uh, a new relation with nature. So the, this, uh, this relation will only come if we realize that we are not the owners of, of our planet, but uh, we are participants uh, as many other species in our planet. No? Uh, technology certainly uh, increases greatly our access to information, but our reality, no matter what people say, we, we are as naturalists, we deeply believe that, our reality is not uh, just an exchange of <coughs> digital information. Our reality is, uh, uh, and we experience that every day. No, it's much more than that. There are many internal and external processes that cannot at all be digitized. No, so the challenge is is how we find uh, new uh, ways to perceive and experience nature. That's that's the enhancing of our participation in the living earth. No. This is what it's named environmental action. The, the, the world that we live in is the world that we experience, the world that, that we experience in a continuous and, 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 and deep way. No? So that's, that's the challenge, how we search for that 
uh, we search that uh, through possibly non-conventional and, and non, uh, let's call it non-objective ways. There are many subjective but real ways to, to experience nature and that comes uh, not only through science but also through philosophy, arts, popular knowledge, even rituals. You know, all this can expand our participation and our, our vision uh, and the reality that comes out from that participation. You know? And the goal is uh, has to be this uh, uh, development of uh, of uh, cognitive, sensory, spiritual perceptions of nature. That that the, the final goal is a natural evolution of Homo sapiens with uh, two words: happiness. No, so so this is uh, basically what we are proposing here, and and and, um, and this will will in a way uh, certainly how how we we develop this in the future will uh, determine the the futures uh, of of our living planet. So. Uh, I'll quickly introduce our three speakers. I'll do the three in a row because uh, we, this way we don't keep exchanging uh, uh, presentations, but uh, we, it's really a pleasure and we are very thankful to our three speakers. The uh, first one is Tom Oliver. He, he is at uh, the University of Reading in the UK, a professor in ecology and, and research in for environment at, at this university. And he is very much uh, uh, involves and recognizes the importance of uh, uh, collectivism, of sharing, of participatory and collaborative processes beyond uh, individualism, uh, and that's uh, set within this this uh, recognition of the cultural ecosystems. No, and he'll tell he'll talk today about this interchange to tackle the planetary environmental crisis. Uh, this is really really motivating. I I. I uh, at the Science for Sight Working Group, we, we feel that this is really important. So we are very pleased to have him and thank him in advance. Uh, our second speaker is joining all the way from New Zealand. And uh, pretty late for her at the, uh, right now, she is Gabriela Baron, and, and she is a designer, works at the University of Auckland. And she'll uh, have this artistic, this designer point of view. She shows a little bit how how design, how new perceptions, new interactions uh, can help in 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 uh, enhancing this this reality, this real world, no? and this in certain to be addressed. And our uh, last uh, speaker is Jordi Pijem. He's I think we lost Josep. There he's back. Great. We can resume, Josep. You were about to present Jordi. Could you please unmute yourself? And reshare your screen. Thank you. You're still muted, Joseph. You need to sorry unmute that. Now you hear me? Yes, great. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I somehow touched something that I mute myself. So Jordi is our last speaker. Uh, and uh, uh, he's going to uh, join from, from uh, Spain. and. He is a philosopher that has been very much involved in, in different uh, relations with, with our world around and with other living beings. And he'll tell us a little bit about the way he sees uh, nature and the ocean in particular. He has this vital intelligence and, and he'll uh, talk us about these uh, different ways of understanding oceans and life. So. With no more delay, dilation, I, I, I thanks again, and I'll, I'll leave the floor to, to Tom. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, it's great to be here this morning uh, talking about this topic. So I'm going to jump right in and, and talk about inner change for tackling our environmental crisis. Um, so 
We face, obviously, this severe and growing planetary environmental crisis, you know, whether that's climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, disruption of nitrogen, uh, cycling, air pollution, water pollution, all these linked environmental problems. And of course, um, you know, linked and driven by shared drivers, but also having shared impacts on our society. So uh, factors like mass human migration, food insecurity, um, disruption of energy supplies, all things that we're becoming increasingly worryingly more familiar with over recent years, and we can expect to continue to do so. So I spent my first um, maybe eight years uh, researching about impacts on uh, biodiversity and how the natural environment is changing. Other areas as well, looking at, for example, water quality, um, habitat fragmentation. But I did find I was, and kind of feeding into, with many hundreds you know, of other scientists into these international assessments. But I did start to become a bit disillusioned in the sense I felt we were just sort of articulating the decline of the natural environment in ever more nuanced ways. And I really wanted to sort of think about the types of solutions. So it's really maybe from this 2018 paper mentioned here, where we started to look at what are the lock-in mechanisms that prevent us transforming some of these socio-ecological systems. And I won't go into that paper in detail, but we looked at the different lock-in mechanisms from regulatory aspects to economic elements, technological, biophysical constraints. Um, and really the conclusion was that all these factors are important. But I do feel, um, and I, you know, from my work in uh, science policy with the European Environment Agency and, and in the UK with DEFRA, our Department for Environment, I did start to feel that there's a lot of focus on the economic and the technological innovation, but really less focus on these kind of deeper elements of cultural change that arguably are very important. So, you know, economic fixes, we talk, we can kind of quantify the value of nature and feed that into our economic processes. But, you know, there are big, there's a lot of wishful thinking around this. So, for example, you know, there's an estimate that we only have named um, a few of the species. So maybe two thirds or even up to 90% of species in the ocean are uh, don't even uh, aren't recognized by science yet. So obviously that's purely a, a big constraint on being able to quantify their value for um, nutrient cycling or decomposition or food for higher trophic levels. So this economic approach is, is wishful thinking also in the sense that, you know, the idea is we can just uh, incorporate nature into those decisions and then we can grow GDP without destroying the environment. But actually, you know, we're very far from uncoupling economic growth from that environmental degradation. And the more we treat nature as an asset, the more we psychologically distance ourselves from it. You know, we don't look after our family in, in this kind of transactional way. We, we, we see them as part of our shared identity and arguably the same with our relationship with nature, you know, to, to kind of psychologically distance it could have perverse effects. So, you know, econ economic fixes are important. I'm not denying they're not, but it's just that they are necessary, but not sufficient for the solution. And the same with technological innovation, you know, people talk about geoengineering climate change, putting iron filings in the ocean to imp improve, you know, increase photosynthesis and drawdown of carbon. But all these, um, you know, big ideas, you know, maybe have merit and, and are worth considering, but they could have big, big side effects. They treat the planet as one big kind of guinea pig. And, and essentially, you know, there is a role for technological innovation, but it's, again, um, often addressing the kind of symptoms rather than addressing the root cause and the drivers of these issues. So today I want to kind of unpick those layers and talk about these deeper layers of, of cultural change and around really our, not just our values and attitudes, but our identity with, with nature. So we don't know how uh, early humans had a relationship with nature, but we can uh, speculate that it'd be very different to the kind of relationship that we have now. We do know that um, philosophers such as Rene Descartes here really started to push this idea that we are separate from nature. We even have a mind which is separate from our body, our divine mind separated from a, 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 mechan a mechanistic body. And also this idea that, um, that we are separate, humans are separate from the rest of the world, this human exceptionalism. And, and this anthropocentric perspective has dominated many uh, environmental uh, science policy reports, as you can see here from this IP best values assessment. And, you know, this is the type of framing that, you know, we might take a very instrumental uh, relationship with nature and ask what it does for us. You know, you're, many of you are familiar with this kind of ecosystem services framing. Um, and this is what IP best initially, so IP best, the intergovernmental platform for biodiversity ecosystem services. Um, and initially they took this framing, trying to, to do this big assessment of, of biodiversity. 
and, and the benefits that we get from nature. But it was rejected by many countries, um, especially countries in the global south, who just don't have this this worldview where we see nature as something there for us. And it's much more of an attitude of kind of kinship and relationship. And in their, you know, to their merit, the IP best secretariat didn't just kind of roll over this. They took a step back and said, you know, we we can't push this this kind of worldview and try and create this global assessment, you know, the kind of epistemic injustice, I guess you might call it from that that approach. So they took a step back and said, well, let's have this values assessment. And actually, of course, many different cultures around the world have a different, you know, wildly different views of of, of um, humans and their relationship. But there are some common threads, actually. All these cultures, for example, from around the world have a sense of nature as being an ancestor and, and a part of our kin. And actually, modern science is perhaps confirming these these views, you know, in contrary to this idea that we are isolated and distinct individuals separate from each other uh, and separate from nature. I mean, if you just think about what's in our body, our, our body is 65 percent oxygen. So just take a moment to think about that. I mean, it, uh, me right now, that's probably 40 to 50 kilograms of oxygen and inside you as well. And of course, let's ask where those molecules come from. When we die, for example, those molecules will be returned to the atmosphere. They, they, we don't all float around because the oxygen is bound together with hydrogen uh, in those dense intermolecular forces of water molecules. But when our body dies, those molecules will, will spread out and they will disperse ultimately around the entire Earth. Let's just say, obviously, they'll go into the oceans as well. But let's just say hypothetically now that they just go into the atmosphere 100 kilometers high. So just have a have a think about all those molecules of oxygen that are in your body, 40 to 50 kilograms, are going to spread around the entire atmosphere. How far apart would those molecules be on average? So it turns out that those molecules would actually be about 0.3 millimeters apart. So you could take a meter cube from anywhere in the atmosphere, let's say 87 kilometers above the, the Petronas Towers in Malaysia, and there would be 27 million molecules of oxygen that were once in your body. So that's a dense fog of molecules, and that's mingling with a dense fog of molecules that were once in other animals, of zebras, of whales, of wallabies, of shrews, of porpoises. When you take a deep breath, you're breathing in a zoological legacy. So our bodies are made of countless other organisms or, or, or molecules that want part of countless other organisms, of course. But also when you take a deep breath, you're breathing in bacteria because in the air around us is a bacteria that are shed from our skin. We have our own uh, unique microbial signature based on the DNA that we have on our body. We have bacteria uh, all over our skin, 440 species in our elbow joints, um, a thousand species in our mouths, 125 species behind our ears, depending on how often we wash. And of course, we have bacteria inside us as well. We have bacteria in our guts. And you've many of you have read, I'm sure, about the kind of microbiome and how those um, organisms inside us, bacteria, fungi, uh, viruses, change our emotions as well. Um, they can they can detract from our supposed individual autonomy. So, you know, our body are made of we have about 38 trillion bacterial cells in our body and about 37 trillion human cells. So about the same number. And even within our human cells, we have mitochondria. So of course, these are the powerhouses of the cells that create energy. And those mitochondria were originally from free living bacteria that were engulfed by another cell. And that eukaryotic cell became the progenitor of all animal life, including humans. So really we are this kind of chimera of human and bacteria and protozoa and fungi. Um, of course, what makes it, you know, us when we look in the mirror, that body that does persist over time is our DNA that builds that body with materials and energy scavenged from the environment. But actually, our DNA is just borrowed from our ancestors and we'll pass it on to our ancestors to come. And of course, DNA travels horizontally across the tree of life as well. So um, of our 20,000 human genes, incidentally, we have about 2 million bacterial genes in us. So they, they do a lot of the work in processing our vitamins, etc. Um, but our 20,000 human genes, about 125 came horizontally across the tree of life. So vectored by viruses. Uh, so our genes for placenta development in humans come from rabbit populations, for example. So really, the tree of life is not these kind of distinct uh, tips with species separated at the end. It's actually a dense, tangled web. And humans are just a thread. We are just a thread in this, this great tapestry of life. But of course, you know, we're not just our bodies, you know you could say, well, you know, here in my head, this is me, isn't it? This does define a discrete kind of autonomous individual that is me. 
but actually every word that we hear today every every touch changes the neural networks in our brains so we have about 150 billion neurons in our head and they change all the time so in uh, mammalian brains maybe about 500,000 connections made or lost every second so you're not the same person that you were last year but you're really not the same person that you were even half an hour ago every time we hear a word we we interact with each other we're changing each other's brains and our minds are much more porous than we than we initially think and of course smells actually even um things that occur below a conscious radar so Humans have smell pheromones and you could do some nice experiments where you put people in T-shirts and push them out of airplanes, ideally with parachutes. And then you take them and you put the T-shirts on a mannequin. And these are the types that dentists practice their dental surgery on. And if you take a control treatment where you make someone sweat, but in not a fearful situation. So they're just going to the gym, they're listening to country music, but you take both T-shirts, they're both equally kind of pungent. But actually, dentists make more mistakes when they're exposed to those pheromones from the, the skydiving situation. So anxiety is a contagious emotion through these pheromones. And also uh, well-being and happiness have also been shown in recent years to, to be transmitted through these smell chemicals. So really, we are you know, influencing each other all the time and our brains are changing. And of course, you've probably read about social network theory and um the idea that we we influence people in these social networks that we've never even met. So up to three links away, your voting preferences, your risk of obesity, your taste in music can all be influenced by people you've never even met. And likewise, they are influencing you through whatever social media app you might use. And just to give one last example, kind of breaking down this idea that, you know, we are working isolated and distinct, you know, all these inventions here, a thermometer, telephone, steamboat, all invented in different countries independently. In some cases, patents filed in different countries in the same week. So, you know, we have this myth of inventors in the Western world, for example. When I think of inventor, I think of someone, I don't know, working away in their shed, a great mind, you know, building something. But actually, all these inventions, as I said, created in different places. And it's almost like our human knowledge is kind of just like a river ready to kind of birth these innovations. And if it wasn't over here, you know, it would be someone else over here. So innovation is a great part of, you know, a great linked creative human endeavor. So, you know, physically, this idea that we're separate is, is an illusion. You know, we, we have a, just a continual transfer of energy and matter through us, our cells with us just a few weeks, skin cells, just a few weeks, gut cells, just a few days. We're continually being rebuilt through genes, which are just borrowed from cut and pasted from the tree of life. And even our kind of independent psychology shows that we're, you know, influenced all the time by on a moment to moment basis by others. Now, why did we, you know, why do we have then this illusion that we are sort of separate from each other? And it's like any illusion, you know, you might understand it conceptually, but then you turn back and you kind of see, see the illusion again. Our, our, our kind of perception snaps back to seeing the world you know, and, and it's our sense of ego, our sense of isolation. And that's because we've evolved that. We actually need a sense of self. So I'm not arguing that we, we shouldn't have a sense of self in any way. We need a sense of self to collate our memories, find food, to to uh, manage our complex social interactions. But actually, if you think about where we evolved, we would have had a, a small groups, maybe 100, 150 people and a balance of individualism versus collective group identity. And if I was to be too selfish and steal from the group, then I'd be excluded or, or physically punished. Whereas in the modern world, I can buy something and it can impact, you know, oceans on the other side of the planet or uh, rainforest on the other side of the planet uh, there's no laws to stop me it's not even kind of moral you know it's not even frowned upon so actually our economies have become globalized enabling us to create these these ripple effects of our actions that accumulate across billions of people to become vast tidal waves of environmental destruction and our moral systems and our legal systems haven't really kept pace or our sense of identity hasn't kept pace um a nice analogy, I think, is, is our tendency to eat fatty or sugary food. You know, it evolved because these food sources were scarce in our early human environment. But now these types of foods are super abundant and our culture actually makes it worse. You know, ch advertising uh, cheap food deserts, for example. And the outcome is two billion people are overweight, whilst two billion people are malnourished or underweight in some way. So we have this evolutionary adaptation 
which was helpful in our early history, but it's become maladaptive, detrimental in the modern world. And our culture, rather than kind of helping to rein in those genetic tendencies, has made it worse. And I would argue that our sense of self as uh, isolated, atomized individuals is has become worse through our culture. So whether it's, you know, uh, leaders like Margaret Thatcher saying there's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families, um, whether it's our education system saying, well, you know, build self-esteem, great, but but trying to sell yourself as a personal brand, for example. Of course, if our brains are changing all the time on a momentary basis, then selling ourselves as a kind of personal brand, a fixed, discrete entity is going to cause cognitive dissonance that causes unhappiness. And really as well, you know, these this pushing of, of the self-identity towards this individualistic end of the spectrum is is um, been exacerbated by our culture and lots of different data sets um, tracking changes in individualism over the last 50 years. Majority of countries shown in blue colours here showing increases in individualism, more use of, of individualistic words in our books and our songs, increases in narcissism. This is the narcissism uh, personality inventory. So extremes forms of selfish individuality. So a kind of worrying situation where our culture has made things worse and an increasing disconnect with nature. You can ask people surveys about how they feel connected to nature or not. And um, it shows in many countries we've become increasingly disconnected in our self sense of self overlap with nature. And these are important. There are lots of different metrics and there are at least one of these that are adapted to ocean connectedness as well. Um, and what they show, not just through single papers, but whole meta analyses is that when people feel more connected to nature, they tend to be they tend to recycle more, reduce their carbon footprint, uh, join nature conservation organizations. So these pro environmental behaviors flow from this kind of inner change. So <clears throat> a big question is how we can uh, enable that. Lots of different practices. So, for example, charities taking people out in nature um, to try to improve nature connectedness and look at the sort of evidence base of improving that. And I wrote this book called The Self Delusion, which was about this kind of facts, facts about our connectedness with nature. Um, and interestingly, it does show a slight increase in nature connectedness from reading the book before and after. There's a QR code that you could scan and try to assess whether it's actually having a difference. Because I had an interesting debate with an environmental psychologist who said it's about the practice. You know, it's like trying to be an archer, fire, fire an arrow into a target. Um, you could understand it conceptually, but you need to practice and build in those new neural networks. And it's the same with our habits of thinking. But the reason I maybe explain how the book can have some effect is maybe understanding this connection with nature the science around it motivates us to then do some of these practices that evidence shows really do change our brains and help us you know break down this sense of of a uh, highly atomized individuality so there's lots in this slide that i can't you know don't have time to sort of unpack about some of these different practices um but i think it's very promising and what's also i suppose promising on an optimistic note is many organizations science policy organizations have moved now towards talking about these deeper cultural change so you can see i best ip best talking about moving away from individualistic values towards sustainability aligned values of collectivism and care and you talk and see here human centric society so very positive uh change but of course we need to see change on the ground and i guess one note of oh sorry and there's if you're interested more there's a, a course here you can look at these quotes and i had this, some podcasts with um this is gus speth who was the the lead of the undp and bob watson who is the chair of ipcc and ipbes and asked them about this change in in kind of uh science policy towards focusing on inner change um but i guess one kind of just to end on one sort of caution you know we can have this i you know this this grating influence of ideas that we need to change our inner self and we can have this idea of virtuous circles where we restore nature we become more connected to nature and then we do more pro-environmental behaviors but it equally works the other way as well and you know the the risk that as we um destroy nature we get these knee-jerk reactions so people feeling less connected to nature they have more mental health problems also at other levels as well, you know, our response to environmental crisis at the group level, whether we become more nationalistic and xenophobic and whether that hampers the kind of, you know, uh, interdisciplinary cooperation we need for these transboundary problems. So there's a lot more in that this paper, if you're interested. So I'll end there because I, uh, yeah, I think I've gone slightly over, but just to say, you know, these problems can seem so daunting, climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, but actually many of the solutions lie 
within us and and the beauty of our kind of connectedness to each other is that although things can seem quite gloomy uh, because we we influence each other so much if we change our attitude our worldviews and our behaviors we can influence others and see quite rapid social social change so thank you very much for listening and um, look forward to the discussion thank you very much tom really really interesting um, amazing um, many figures and many many feelings so so uh, with no more delay we move to gabriela thanks gabriela for joining very late for you from the other side of the world thanks okay hello can you hear me okay yeah okay so thank you tom for the amazing introduction that you did to the problems that we're facing collectively uh today i'm going to talk about co-creating regenerative realities so how can we as a community uh, try to align ourselves and to become whole again uh, in the sense of not disconnected from nature so a little bit about me I mean I was already introduced so I don't have to say much but I do want to say that usually in in these academic or scientific settings I say oh I've got a, a PhD on environmental engineering because I'm a designer and, you know, and people don't trust designers as much as they trust engineers, right? Because they do real science. And um, so I wanted to show a bit this. And I also wanted to show how I introduced myself here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who is, which is the land uh, originally occupied by Maori. And the way that Maori present themselves is they talk about their whakapapa, which is the genealogy in order to, to see if you have something in common to the other person that you're meeting. So you talk about which one is your mountain and which one is your river. And that of course shows like where you come from. You talk about your family name and, and your name. And, uh, but you also show this connection, this genealogic connection where the mountain is before the river and then it's your ancestors or your human ancestors, right? Because the other thing, I mean, apart from presenting myself as an engineer, is that I'm a mom, I'm a woman, and I'm a deeply spiritual person. And I always had that, but that part of my life did not have a room in my, did not have a lot of space in my professional life. And it's been a process of trying to integrate that, to be like, how can I be whole? How can I bring all that I am into any project that I that I lead. So I've been working on sustainability for many years, um, especially as a designer, as a product designer, and trying to understand what can design do to, to change, you know, to help solve these complex problems. And what I see is that usually, you know, society focuses a lot about practices. When you see innovation, you see like all these people doing this technical innovation. Uh, that it's easily perceived by our senses. So it's like new technologies, maybe a new policy. But then that is sh very short lived if it's not, if it doesn't have a foundation that it's usually unseen, but it's like a community of practice. And it's a community that could be an interdisciplinary group of people doing different things. And it's the quality of this community is the, the power sharing in this community it's the trust because when you have a new project if you don't have a community behind it it will be very short-lived and or it will be very very um, um let's say fragile but then communities are also organized around their beliefs and their mental models well here we have another iceberg model very similar to the one that tom shared but that's it so if we don't have similar beliefs, similar ways of thinking, similar values, um, then all the innovation is very fragile. So when I see this model, I'm thinking, how can we operate within these three levels? Because usually you have, you know, maybe engineers or something, they're, they're working in the practice level or, or some scientists. But then you have the communities that actually run these pro I mean that that make these projects be sustainable in the long run. Um, and then you have the mindset. But there's it's usually separate people or separate disciplines. And when I look at this, I'm like, how can we bring everything together? 
And this is the question, how might we integrate? How can we become whole? So integrate the technical, the relational, and the spiritual realms uh, of marine conservation in this case. And, uh, and when you think of this integration, you also have to understand that people are these whole selves, right? They have connection to nature. They have, maybe they say and they think something, but then they feel and they know different things. So there are other ways of knowing that might not be scientific or not might not be perceived with our senses. And there's a lot of, um, yeah, tacit and, and latent knowledge uh, behind beneath the surface of what we can see. So as a, from my design side, I started working with participatory methodologies because we have all this theory, right? So how would we make that actually actionable? And uh, and I found that participatory design, uh, I mean, it's not something new, but it has been reinvented with the rise of design thinking. And you probably are familiar with design thinking. Uh, some people do it right, some people do it wrong. <laughs> so many people actually hate design thinking. But, um, but participatory design is really working with communities and really working from the mindsets level. Um, so in the sense of when you're doing a strategic project, you think, okay, how can I regenerate ecosystems? And how do I regenerate the social cultural fabric around these ecosystems? It's very place-based and it does involve technical solutions probably, but it also involves meanings and stories and beliefs. So in general, a co-design process, I mean, and this is not from me, but it's like really building the con conditions and working together with different people interdisciplinarily to understand and find collectively uh, solutions or, I mean, solutions are, it's a big word, but like how to tackle these problems and how to find resilience in the face of climate change and, of all, uh, and, and other complex problems that we're facing. And uh, so I ended up creating this methodology called Design for Conservation because um, I had many colleagues working on the conservation field. And the idea behind this methodology was like, yes, it's okay to integrate our spiritual, our emotional, our uh, side, our values, whatever it is that drives us, that fuels our passion into projects that can be deployed that can be scientific and that can be quite rigorous. So this methodology has um, five steps, but the central step is this reconnection stage. So it's the guiding star that will guide everything that you do. And I think that in science is, is very, very important. So I work with this methodology in the University of Auckland. Um, it's a design thinking methodology. It's very visual and it enables other kinds of knowledge to be expressed, uh, like different types of knowledges and worldviews to be expressed during the process and to have value. Because much of that knowledge, sadly, Western methodologies have disregarded indigenous knowledge or place-based knowledge or the knowledge that comes from lived experience from the communities that are closest to the land and to that body of water or to that sea. Um, so this methodology kind of aims to to integrate that. And um, I'm just gonna, sorry, is this on mute? I'm just gonna talk while I show what this could look like. I mean, it's a lot of, it's it's a lot to say, but within this methodology, there's different tools and the tools, again, how I said, are very visual. So you integrate um, like more rigorous practice of co-creation, of trying to unpack a problem together to frame it, to understand what it means to different stakeholders and to try to create trust between these stakeholders. So in this video, what you can see is like, we're working on a, on a seed library, but we're working with a lot of indigenous peoples and there's a problem of trust between government institutions and local tribes and new technologies. So this is a seed library that it's, um, it's, it's online based. So it's actually a, a knowledge sharing platform. And there's all this indigenous knowledge that it's super valuable, that it's um, a treasure, as they say it here. And uh, why would we give it to, to the Western people, right? So there's a lot of conflicts between the stakeholders. 
um, and the and if we don't solve those conflicts, we will lose a lot of species. So that's why we need to keep the seeds or we will lose the knowledge on how to grow those species. Um, so this is kind of what participatory methodologies could look like. So it's work and then it's play and then it's trust and honesty. And then it's building relationships that last beyond the project. Um, sorry. Um, so what I want to focus also is on how this methodology, I mean, this method talks about like how to frame a problem and how to plan for impact and how to measure impact. And it talks about carbon footprinting and like um, economic models to deploy it sustainably, et cetera. But it does, I want to focus on, on this reconnection phase. And one of the things that we have developed is like, how do we work in the mindset level? How do we speak in a meeting, in a work meeting? about things that go deeper. So in general, when you develop tools um, that invite participants to do this and you create a space to do this within a workshop, within a working group, um, yeah, like a lot of knowledge emerges. So for the mindsets level, I developed these tools, sorry, uh, that are mostly based on like using biomimicry. So inspired, by nature, like thinking, what are the general rules that govern natural systems that we can say, are they ruling? Are we aligned with these rules? Is our project aligned with these rules as well? So these are the seven mindsets that we have proposed. And again, it's a work in progress, but I'm gonna go very briefly through each mindset. So these actually, the tool looks like cards and we and there's different ways of using the tools, but um. In general, you try to understand, so, okay, so is my project actually balanced? So am I methodologically balanced? Or is my group actually balanced? And balance expresses that duality, that yin and yang principle. And there's like so many cultures and so many religions and so many philosophies that actually acknowledge this duality. And, um, and it's mostly like a feminine and masculine principle. In terms of uh, Jungian, psychology so it's not actually related to gender I mean it's it is sorry it's it is related to gender but it's not about gender it's about your approaches to solving a problem so let's say that this seminar because we're speaking of connection and of care and of that it's more like a feminine aspect of the care of the ocean right whereas the masculine energy it's a very much needed energy that it's about moving and doing and getting stuff deployed and actually being efficient. But sadly, the world or Western science has mostly based itself on the masculine principle, not leaving any space for the feminine principle. So how can you support the group you're working with? How can you use even things like intuition? Like what is this, this the place for intuition when you're making a decision? Um, another card is about cyclicity. So in general, the design for conservation method, it's like that. It's a spiral. A spiral means that it's iterative, but it goes deeper and deeper. And with each cycle, we understand better. We learn We learn from our mistakes. So when you think in cycles like, yeah, nothing is lost. It's a closed system. And then nature is cyclic. Um, for example, one of the tools that I work here um, with Maori is um, a moon calendar. And we try to understand how us as parts of like creatures that are part of an ecosystem and are deeply influenced by everything around us, like Tom said, like what are the best days to have meetings that are really productive, which are the best ways to connect, which are the days that we will work and it will be super efficient and amazing, and which are the days to avoid because the conflict might arise. And we try to understand how that is guided by the moon. And it's not only us, it's actually Auckland Council, so government bodies. <laughs> are trying to do this. I mean, and it's just a start. But right now in Auckland, we have the Auckland Climate Festival as well, and it's all organized on the Maramataka, the, the moon calendar, the environmental calendar. And it's quite interesting once you start making space to observe these things and to feel from a different space, uh, from a different place. So not so much rational, but really to tune into the environment. Um, another card is about systemic, 
So it's really understanding that every little change that you make will resonate throughout the whole system. Everything is connected. So you're not expected to understand all the implications of a project, but at least to acknowledge that there's a lot of things that you will be affecting when you make these decisions and just to monitor them, keep your eyes open in case you made a mistake. Um, another card is positive. And again, like Tom said, there's a lot of environmental anxiety and I see it a lot with young people that I teach. And, and it's really important that if you want to suggest a change or you want to work for the environment, you do it from a place of love and compassion for the human race. Um, because anger and fear can create projects that are that are not the right approach to, to, to healing the world. So how can you nurture those positive thoughts? And even when you feel you're, like you're fighting against the whole system to protect nature, how can you stay positive? And that's a really important thing in a group. Um, humble is about slow wisdom. So we're pushed by technology this and technology that, and that's going so fast. But it's like the earth knows and things go slow in the earth and they have the right time and the right place. So how can we acknowledge this in our in our processes, right? Um, yeah, so that would be the last mindset and I'm about to finish this. But I do want to say something about co-design because we are, I mean, as a society, we're learning to do this, but it's growing a lot. And probably many of your projects will involve citizen participation or working together with local communities. And in general, um, many times design thinking it's not done completely right. So one of the things is like, we need professional experience. Of course, we need the experts, the, we need the scientists, but experts are also the people that are closest to the problem, to the land that have lived there in that place and they know the sea, they know the ocean. Um, Kurdistan is also not ignoring things that actually work or inventing the wheel from zero. So you can build on amazing things that are, are already being done. Um, Kurdistan is not asking people's opinion. It's really about that power sharing. It's really about me thinking I will keep my mind open into not knowing what the right solution is. Maybe something else comes up here. So, so you have to share the power on critical decision-making. Um, Co-design is also not like a large group of academics with a couple of indigenous peoples because there, there's a big power imbalance there. Um, yeah, and it's also not coercion, but yeah. So I want to finish this with, with a quote that I heard that I just loved here. And it's like, you know, for academics like me, so stop learning about the ocean in books, stop learning the science of the ocean and go out and actually learn from the ocean. So maybe silence the mind and try to learn from here and learn from other places and then try to integrate that into your projects. That type of knowledge is knowledge that we are starving from. We need that knowledge and we need that for decision makers and for scientists. Yeah, so that's me. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Thanks for such an inspiring talk. And, and uh, so we move uh, with no more delay to our last speaker. I take the opportunity to thank Jordi that he replaced uh, Andreas uh, last minute because Andreas had some personal issues that couldn't handle. But Jordi, we are certain that that we are going to have a, a very nice conversation with him, and uh, he's he's a wonderful uh, thinker. So please, uh, Jordi, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jose Luis, and thank you also, Evini and Emma, for organizing this meeting. Thank you, Tom and Gabriela, for your uh, talks. Um, I'm very happy to, to fill in for, for my friend, Andreas Beva. And I realized that um, the three of us um, are seeing uh, a crucial importance in mindsets. I I'm going to be talking also about mindsets. So I prepared the presentation. It's the first time I'm going to share a presentation online. Let me see if I can do it. 
Um, hold on. Is this one? Yes. Uh, right. So back here. Okay. Um, I'm starting with a, a quote that actually fits in very well with this idea of learning uh, from the ocean that um, Gabriella was mentioning. This is from Rachel Carson, the marine biologist. Um, she uh, got the uh, American US National Book Award in 1952 for her book, The Sea Around Us. And people noticed that for a scientific book, there was um, a lot of poetry, not poetry in the sense of uh, rhymes, but there was a, a beautiful language uh, triggering uh, emotion, connection, um, depth of relation and so on. So she said the following, if there is poetry in my book about the sea, it is not because I deliberately put it there, but because no one could write truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. And I suppose if you all uh, love the oceans, um, you will understand this idea that uh, there is something that our data, our equations cannot grasp about the sea. There is some sort of poetry that also needs to be reflected. So I'm asking the following, since, since Rachel Carson said this over 70 years ago, have we brought much more poetry into our understanding of the sea? Or just more, um, as Tom was saying, have we managed to articulate better the decline of the sea with more data, more nuances, and so on? In fact, what we've done mostly since then is uh, developing um, in, in this extraordinary manner a so-called artificial intelligence. This is a screenshot for a talk given in March this year by Tristan Harris and Asa Raskin on the dilemmas that are being um, put forward by, by so-called um, artificial intelligence. And if you can see the, the image among them, they, they uh, mention reality collapse, fake everything, not just fake news, fake everything, trust collapse, collapse of law, uh, automated fake religions, exponential blackmail, and so on and so on. So something is happening with this path we've taken of um, trying to see uh, progress just through information technologies and basically forgetting poetry. Now, this has to do with the fact that when uh, modern science uh, begins in the 17th century, there is this uh, idea that only is real, only is truly real what can be put into numbers, what is quantifiable. This is an idea that is uh, written explicitly by both René Descartes and by Galileo. Both of them assert that what can be uh, measured, such as length, weight, acceleration, and so on, this is real. Everything else, including uh, colors and uh, pain and pleasure and beauty and justice and sounds and, and, and everything else, insofar as it cannot be measured, they say it is not uh, truly real. So we've come to implicitly understand that, for instance, uh, the, the color uh, red that we experience in our um, daily life is not as real as a wavelength of uh, 700 uh, nanometers. And the color blue is not as real as the wavelength of about uh, 450 nanometers. Obviously, if you go to a museum and you're looking at works of art, or you're looking at the ocean, simply, um, you don't care about the numbers uh, of nanometers in the wavelengths. You care about the experience, about the colors, about what you're really perceiving, about this world that is being brought forth uh, in the interaction be between you and with this um, around you. So from this idea that what is real is only what can be measured, we seem to have moved to the idea that what is truly real is what can be put into digits, what can be put into the language of so-called artificial intelligence. Now, uh, 40 years ago, exactly 40 years ago, uh, this December, Barbara McClintock was given the uh, Nobel Prize for uh, Medicine or Physiology. And in her um, speech uh, accepting the Nobel Prize, she insisted on the idea that every cell has a sensing quality. They sense, they have a sensations of what's around them. And that's what allows cells to, uh, to be able to, to be functional. Not only that, but um, if you can see the quotation um, on the, on the right-hand side at the bottom, she even says um, that, the, that we should um, investigate how uh, 
the extent of knowledge the cell has of itself and how it utilizes this knowledge in a thoughtful manner when challenged. So Barbara McClintock, uh, when receiving the Nobel Prize 40 years ago, is uh, uh, using this expression that the cell um, uses uh, its knowledge uh, in a thoughtful manner. Uh, and she was saying in, in that Nobel lecture that it was uh, urgent to develop this kind of approach. And as you may know, um, she uh, made her discoveries by basically feeling her way into the organism. In fact, her um, biography written by Evelyn Fox Keller uh, has the title, A Feeling for the Organism. So this idea of feeling your way into, into, into knowledge is, has been very much um, eclipsed in our current um, mindset. Um, but then with the development of this um, science that takes us basically real what can be measured, some surprises arise. Um, as uh, Tom was saying, we have dozens of trillions of cells in our bodies, but um, the more we look into them, we realize that they have an enormous variety. And basically there, is, there are no two cells that are alike and they are not working in a, in a mechanical manner, but the more we look at them, we realize they work in a, what we could call an organic, mat, an organic manner. Uh, this is an article from Science from uh, 2011. And I just read you the, the beginning, it says the following. If you think air traffic controllers have a tough, tough job, sorry, if you think air traffic controllers have a tough job guiding planes into major airports or across a crowded continental airspace, consider the challenge facing a human cell trying to position its proteins. The latest analysis suggests that some of our cells make more than 10,000 different proteins and a typical mammalian cell will contain more than a billion individual protein molecules. Somehow, a cell must get all its proteins to their correct destinations. And equally important, keep these molecules out of the wrong places. So basically, what we are realizing is that um, cells are much more efficient than any human factory, and that they um, make these prodigies of efficiency um, in silence without producing any residues, uh, using the energy of the metabolism and with an accuracy that we cannot really understand because what is guiding each of these cells? If someone thinks that the brain is um, guiding the cells of the body, ask yourself, what is the brain made of? It's made of nothing else than cells itself. Uh, but also we are discovering that there is intelligence everywhere in all kinds of forms of life. This is an article published in Nature back in the year 2000 and was using the, the word intelligence at the end of the article, literally intelligence, to uh, describe the behavior of a slime mold that could find a, the best way through a labyrinth. So we are realizing that there is intelligence in all forms of life. And in my book uh, that in Spanish is called Inteligencia Vital, I argue that there is no life without intelligence and in the same way, there is no intelligence without life. But now, if there is intelligence and sensing, as McClintock was saying 40 years back, in every uh, organism and even in every single cell, couldn't we see an ecosystem or an ocean or the whole biosphere as a symphony of ex experiences, as a symphony of beings that each of them have their own experience? So just to focusing in our experience as human beings, feel the experience of every plant, animal, and any being that is there, being part of this symphony that is uh, the ecosystem. But instead of doing that, we've uh, moved more and more into um, so-called artificial intelligence. Um, in the 1950 article with which Alan Turing basically um, started the, the whole field, um, the, the first section is called The Imitation Game, that is actually also the title of a film about, about Turing, because uh, what he argues is that we cannot really know if machines think or not think. What we can try is to make them um, imitate intelligence. And the whole article uses uh, the word imitate all the time. So um, what we get from these uh, systems of artificial intelligence is not true intelligence, but imitation. Um, that is, the Google Translate may gives the impression that it's intelligent because it can translate some things. Uh, if you put a good poem, um, it's very difficult that it 
would translate it well. But even if it were to translate it in a decent manner, what is obvious is that Google Translate wouldn't have understood a word of the, of the poem, or, or even more, not just the word, wouldn't have understood the, the deep meaning of the poem. There is no understanding, there is no experience in machines. The, um, the definition of intelligence in the Oxford English Dictionary, the first definition is the faculty of understanding. Intelligence requires understanding. And so-called artificial intelligence systems can imitate intelligence, but they themselves cannot and will never be able to understand, to have understanding, to have experience, to have consciousness. Even if many people are investing millions in that, but doesn't make any sense. And uh, some of us have been saying this for many years, and every time I speak to uh, with an expert on artificial intelligence, they agree. But somehow we got this collective idea that these machines can think and will have consciousness one day. Um, they will not be ever intelligent, but they can certainly be very powerful. And my suggestion is to use the um, to read the acronym AI as algorithmic invasion, because it's an invasion of our relations, of our jobs, of our world. Now, going back to the sentence by uh, Rachel Carson, no one could write truthfully about the sea and leave out the poetry. What would be a more poetic and less algorithmic understanding of marine life and all life? Now, uh, to give some hints, I use some uh, quotations from, from the 19th century. Here is one from Goethe, the, the poet and, and natural scientist. He initiated uh, morphology and some other uh, scientific uh, disciplines or areas. He says that um, if we want to achieve a living contemplation of nature, we must become as flexible and supple as she is, following her own example. To understand nature, uh, be like nature. And um, someone that in a way started to do that, but at least partly, is Alexander von Humboldt, that in, he, in a letter uh, to a friend uh, of 1806, he writes, in the rainforest of the Amazon River and in the high ranges of the Andes, I realized that there is only one life animated by one single breath pervading the stones, plants, and animals, and the swelling breast of human beings. Even if uh, Humboldt includes human beings, notice that he's speaking of a single breath uniting all of us. So we can differentiate human beings, but we are all part of a single breath. Now, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, writes, um, to the dull mind, all nature is leaden. To the illuminated mind, the whole world burns and sparkles with light. That is, there are two different ways of looking at things, he's basically saying. And if you look with a dull mind, everything will be dull. If you look with, with spark, everything will be um, full, full of light. And this is a little sentence for, for uh, this book of mine I, I, I mentioned. Light cannot be understood by means of darkness. Life cannot be understood by means of the non-living. Because um, biology, uh, since the 1940s, basically, has made a big um, move towards trying to understand organisms as mechanisms. And that can give us lots of uh, detailed knowledge, useful for many things, but cannot ultimately make uh, allow us to understand life, because organisms can never be reduced to mechanisms. Now, I want to present something that may uh, sound uh, unusual, but it has been usual, um, normal, to all kinds of uh, traditional cultures, including most indigenous peoples. And both um, Tom and Gabriela mentioned um, um, this respect we need to have for the views of indigenous peoples. And it's the fact that, there are, um, that the mind is not something monolithic, but there are basically many different faculties in the mind, but basically there are two ways of knowing that I choose to call, it seems to me that it's my belief it makes it more clear. One, I call it algorithmic mind, the other one, holistic self. Um, one is utilitarian, the other one is more creative, intuitive and direct. And to give an example, if you look at a sentence or a poem, if you focus on analyzing the grammar and counting the syllables and analyzing the rhymes, you are in the mindset of the algorithmic mind. If you focus on understanding the meaning and the context, you are in the mindset of the holistic self. 
Now, this has been also acknowledged by literally dozens of authors. And I, I give um, a few examples here. Goethe um, uses, I believe, very much in this sense, the German common words Verstand and ver Vernunft. Not everyone uses these two German words in this sense, but Goethe uses Verstand, Verstand for um, the simple rationality that is focused on uh, analyzing and calculating and for for a higher reason that is more poetic and creative and direct. And Bergson, the, the French philosopher, used in a similar manner in these two terms, uh, intellect and intuition. intuition. Now, uh, recently, there is this uh, psychiatrist and philosopher, um, Ian McGilchrist, that has published a monumental book with the title, The Matter with Things, is a book of uh, 1500 pages with over 5,000 references of which 3,000 at least are scientific references. And he mm, makes a very similar distinction about the ways of um, acting of the left hemisphere of the brain and right hemisphere of the brain. And this has nothing to do with the naive ideas about the uh, left and right brain that were popularized some 30, 40 years ago. This is a much more uh, subtle understanding. And um, it's based, as I say, on uh, over 3,000 scientific um, recent re references. Um, what uh, I would distinguish in these two ways of looking at the world is that the algorithmic mind focuses on things and the holistic self on relations, one in quantities, the other one in qualities, one on the static, the other one on the dynamic, one on mechanisms, the other one on patterns and rhythms. The algorithmic mind um, aims to pin down, to analyze, to classify, whereas the holistic self aims to see things in context. The algorithmic mind aims to calculate the holistic self to appreciate, to appreciate beauty, goodness, um, that is um, ethical sensibility, aesthetic sensibility. And ultimately, the algorithmic mind is AI-like and the holistic self is lifelike. Now, if we mm, were to really mm, take fully into account that there are these two different basic ways of knowing, of looking at the world, See what happens, see what's the difference if you look at a poem with one mindset or the other mindset. Or if you look at an organism, if you look at an organism with an algorithmic mind, you see um, genetic codes, you see lots of um, biochemical reactions, all of which is very true and very useful, but you lose sense of the organism, which uh, um, you can see more fully through the holistic self. Or for instance, to, to put a, a an example related to the sea. Uh, if you look at the global conveyor belt through the algorithmic mind, you can make lots of very uh, interesting um, analysis through physics, uh, chemistry, and so on. But it seems to me that this doesn't really explain the, this marvel that is the global conveyor belt. For me, it, it just shows that um, the ocean is much more than a, a thermodynamic system. So in the same way that um, uh, Humboldt was able to see um, a single breath from pole to pole in the whole uh, earth, in the whole biosphere, I, I think we should uh, learn to see something more than physics and chemistry and so on when we uh, look at um, the, the amazing workings of, of, of this living being that is the ocean. Now, I wanted to mention this. Uh, I believe this, this update of the planetary boundaries of the um, Stockholm Resilience Center uh, was published last week, I believe. And I just wanted to show um, that um, global institutions uh, talk so much about CO2 concentration, which of course is a very relevant factor, but if you see here, is by far not the most um, threatening factor to the biosphere, according, according to this very uh, well-recognized analysis. And they've recently introduced a few years ago, this concept of novel entities as what is most threatening to the life of the earth. Novel entities are the uh, 3, 300,000 plus chemical substances that we've developed since the um, scientific revolution. Apparently it's about 350,000 uh, chemical substances that we have produced in the last uh, two, three centuries. Um, so uh, I suppose there is this focus on CO2 concentration because it fits very well with the aims of capitalism, of developing a number of businesses that are very useful. But that doesn't bring us uh, 
into the real picture of what is more uh, threatening to the biosphere. And in any case, what I wanted to, to, to show with this is that much more threatening to the balance and cycles of the biosphere than this um, um, element mentioned here is our prevailing mindset. Our mindset that only looks at what can be uh, measured, quantified, at what can be isolated, at what is static, and is missing so often what is alive. And I think this is my last slide. This is a quotation from um, a philosopher Schelling, uh, this is end of uh, 18th century. I suppose not um, common to to quote uh, such old works in um, in a scientific meeting. But um, I, I like what he says here. He says. He uses the German word philosophieren, but this is in a time when scientists call themselves natural philosophers. So the meaning is thinking in depth, not just philosophizing. Thinking in depth about nature means to raise her up from the dead mechanism in which she appears to be imprisoned, to enliven her with freedom, so to speak, and to let her follow her own free unfolding. I understand that Schelling here is not only saying that we have a um, wrong picture of the world, and this picture portrays uh, nature as a dead mechanism, and therefore we should correct our, our worldview. He's also saying, he's also implying, I believe, I understand, that to change our understanding of nature helps nature to be more free, that we are trapping nature with our algorithmic mind. So that's what I wanted to convey, and I look forward to our exchanges um, now. Thank you very much. I get out of here. Yes. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jordi. Wonderful presentation. Thanks for bringing up uh, all these uh, uh, old one one century old reflections and thoughts and how they they still uh, tell us so much and, and your reflections on, on intelligence. I'll, I'll uh, share my my last slide that it's uh, got a number of questions of reflections and questions for for the speakers, hopefully this will work. Okay, well, uh, I think that, that that you all, and this is wonderful because we certainly have talked among ourselves, no? but, but the, the, the way I think uh, you, you complement each other and you share so many thoughts it is wonderful. No? And, and uh, the emphasis you put on collaboration, on participatory, on, on being part, but not the owners, no? Uh, it's also, uh, I, to me, it's, it's, it's wonderful because also focus towards new directions, no? where we want to go, as I was saying before, as individuals, as, as collectives, uh, as, even as, as species, how, how we want to develop. No? And I think many of the, of the thoughts that you've been sharing are indeed at the heart of of the ocean decade and, and as I explained, are, are, are at the heart of the UNESCO from, for, with sustainable development goals and harmony with nature and are also at the heart of, of the European Union mission ocean and waters. In particular, for example, European Union uh, uh, emphasizes two facilitators. One, one uh, is the digital twin of the ocean and the other is citizen participatory engagement. No? Um, when, when we put, uh, of course, digital twin is trying to replicate everything that it's, let's say, alive, every, all our ocean in, in one computer. And, and, and I totally agree with you that, that that's totally impossible from, from, the, from, from, from many perspectives no? that, that you already uh, discussed. No? Uh, and and the, the other emphasis that you placed it was on, on the collective, on the participatory, on the getting rid of, of individualism, on, on this... Uh, is, this feeling of pertinence, no, uh, and uh, but but everything I think uh, ha has its contribution, no. Uh, in a way, uh, uh, will we be able to find the right balance? Will we be able to get rid of this individualism and, and share? Will we be able to to recognize that 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 we are not the owners, but but we are participants and, and that we are part of of, of this of this uh, uh, ocean planet, no. So the, these uh, uh, points that I raise here, these are the, the uh, things that, in a way, seem to be antagonism, but uh, probably are complementary. No, uh, 
uh, I, I, I personally also tend to to go into the second direction, but probably it's very difficult. And and, and even things like individualism are, uh, add a complexity to the entire to the entire world. No, uh, that that's also so. So it's uh, our crisis are they an opportunity also for for changing the the how where we go? No. The, the, the technological uh, perception of the wall, it's also an opportunity uh, to, to enhance our, our real participatory uh, uh, expanded knowledge of the wall. No? Uh, uh, and how we deal with all these robotics and artificial intelligence issues no, that seem to overpass uh, humans no? in, many, in many ways. No? So, so the emphasis has to be, uh, uh, certainly agree with you no? on consciousness and engagement of people. No? And, but we, we probably uh, the way that right now we connect is through this 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 all these uh, tools no so we have to to take the benefit and, and but keep again the, the right balance no and and finally but probably the, the most important is is wealth power individuality all the, these things that seem to to drift the, the entire society can we turn them around getting rid of this individualism into wisdom happiness empathy you know this I think to me these are some of the points that you've been uh, talking about and and, uh, and uh, we certainly share it within the the science for site uh, uh, working group no so so i have three questions uh, but you, they are very generic and and i'll try that i'll ask you to to be very brief and and but uh, then you can uh, one each of them is addressed to one of you but certainly feel free to to participate the, the three of you know the first one is it's it's our 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 crisis all these crises climatic biodiversity the the lack of solace you know, that we are experiencing as as individuals as as, as a society can, can we see it as an opportunity is perhaps the the first time in the history of humanity that we realize that we are over exploiting a, a, a finite planet and we are over exploiting ourselves is this an opportunity for, for, for us to change? And I address it this to Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. And just to say, yeah, great to hear the other presentations. That's fascinating. Um, so I think, I suppose many complex systems, you know, people have written about how they have different phases and they, you know, might meet a period of crisis and then collapse and then renewal. And that kind of, uh, and Gabriela, Gabriela mentioned that kind of cyclic element of dynamics. and. We could argue that you know our, our unsustainable society, uh, you know, is is meeting that crisis point now, and there'll be some kind of collapse. I think the collapse would have happened earlier if we hadn't have become globalized, because you know, a shortage of resources. If it happens on an island and there's no uh, connection, then that shortage of resources causes collapse earlier. But we've managed to, you know, seek out and and quite you know ingenious in in a way, but in in a kind of short sighted way, is reach out and, and gather resources globally. And, and our offshore our impacts. But actually in a globalized world now, it's starting to come to the point where we can really see the crisis hitting and we have this global crisis and maybe a global collapse. Of course, there's a discussion about what collapse means. Is it a drawn out process of tens, you know, 20, 30 years, 50 years, or is it a, a you know, a series of very rapid escalations? Um, but I think that, you know, then there's some nice scenarios about what could happen to the world. And I think some of them, you know, the, the idea of kind of fortress world where the rich kind of maintain their, their level of um, living for a while uh, by building borders. And you kind of see these impacts happening already, which is quite worrying. Um, but I think we're definitely set for this period of rolling crisis. Um, there's a nice web form called the Great Transitions Initiative, and it outlines these different possible scenarios of the world but the, but for all of them there's this period of starting kind of now uh, this period of rolling crisis that we face and i think in the face of that what i what i what i struggle with is how we there has to be change because our current system is 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 the dry the root cause of the destruction so we either you know ultimately you know make humanity extinct or we come up with some other way of living um but the challenge for me is those seeds exist now, perhaps those different ways of being and those different, you know, and as uh, Jordi kind of talked through the, the kind of seeds have been there for a long time in terms of these different writers picking up the kind of elements of a new way of being in the world and seeing. But how do we carry those seeds through this crisis in the face of, you know, knee jerk reactions, increasing kind of um, xenophobia, increasing right wing governance in, in response to crisis, we get a kind of knee jerk reaction, which in worryingly could be a kind of vicious cycle so I think for me the challenge is how we 
be realistic about the crisis that we face. Um, you know, when we're thinking about sustainability, it's, it's often to, easy to think about everything remaining the status quo and we just have to change ourselves. But we're trying to do that change in the face of increasing catastrophe, catastrophe whether that's, you know, mass human migration, billions of people shifting borders, whether it's extreme climate change, you know, threatening life. So how do we make that change and carry through these, these seeds of a good culture in the face of quite a severe, you know, social crisis? Sorry, that sounded a bit gloomy, but I think that's that's the challenge we face. <laughs> I'd be interested to hear the others' thoughts as well. Thanks, Tom. I don't know if, if Gabriel or, or Jordi want to add something. No, I think that was great. There are some yes, questions we... from the audience, though. So yeah, we have those that. at the very end. We I, I just yeah. moved okay. into the, 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 the coming... Uh... Um, uh, sorry, the coming question. Is oh, or may Gabriela. maybe I can maybe I can yeah. comment something. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. So, so talking about this collective evolution, I've, I mean, I have my personal views of this. Like, I have my views as a as a scientist or an academic, but then I have my personal views, and they're really related to my personal experience as a as a human. And I do believe that things come and they, they will show up until we learn. They will show up in our lives. You know, when, when you just, it happens a lot with parenting. So this problem shows up and shows up and shows up until it's unbearable and you just have to deal with it. So I think we're kind of in that situation. And I can see that there's going to be a lot of learnings from this, but it won't be easy. Like we're going to have to, I believe we're going to have to, to a bit work on, walk on this shadowy path of all this and and face things that will be hard. Um, but I do believe in a collective evolution and I do believe that all this will be learning. And nature is amazingly resilient and I think we overestimate our power and, and it will regenerate eventually, maybe without as many of us. But um, I'm, I think this is a process of collective evolution of, of the planet as a whole system. You know, as, as Tom said, we are a colony of microbiota or yeah, something. I believe the planet, it's a colony of, of all of us. And it's like one big whole being and, and we're just collectively evolving. Like if we are like the cells, <laughs> like the intelligent cells of the planet and we're doing our best. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's me. Kind of very philosophical. <laughs> but... Thank you, Gabriela. We move. Uh, we'll, we'll, maybe, we'll move for the Jose. audience. Oh, maybe sorry. I could say the something. Audience, just, yeah, thank, just a second, uh, Jordi. Sorry. For the audience, See. I just maybe wanted I could... to tell them we, we'll, we'll stretch a little bit longer. So, so please do not leave. So we'll have our speakers. T technically, we were going to be for 90 minutes. So, but we'll have the, your questions at the end. Okay. So we will. We'll, uh, a stretch uh, for for another 20 minutes or so at least uh, if uh, that's fine with with you okay go, go ahead Jordi sorry oh thank you yes I wanted to say a couple of things following on what uh, Gabriela was saying now one is that um, I believe um, the chaotic state of our world reflects the chaotic state of our minds not us personally but the uh, the minds of all of us human beings another thing um is that uh, following on what I was saying, that every single cell appears to have um, intelligence, sensing, appears to know what it's doing, uh, I think it's easy to extrapolate that to the whole biosphere. The whole biosphere has no less self-regulation than a single cell. If a single cell knows what it's doing, there are reasons to suggest that the whole biosphere knows what it's doing which is um, along the lines of the original Gaia hypothesis before it was rephrased in more mechanistic terms. And actually, it's also aligned with the world views of all indigenous peoples I know of that speak of Mother Earth and, and Grandmother Earth sometimes um, and so on. So I would like to add this, this suggestion in line with what uh, Gabriela was saying that my conviction is that the Earth knows what it's doing. Obviously, it's not necessarily um, what is going to benefit our um, consumerist, materialistic mindset. And obviously, we are in tough times. 
and partly we've, we've brought it up ourselves. And certainly, uh, uh, I believe we will need a clear mind and a brave heart to navigate through the waves that are coming ahead. That's, Thank you, that, Thank you very me. much, Jordi. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we move to this second question. I think you, it's been very much uh, answered by, by yourself already, Gabriela. No? Uh, but you have this, this complementary profile of an engineer and a designer and a, a social person. No? And, and, uh, and sometimes it's so difficult no, to, for, for scientists to accept uh, things that are not digital, that are not replicable, that are not uh, square. No? And for, for artists and philosophers, artists, I would say sometimes they see themselves that uh, far away from from a structural and, and uh, re replicable uh, ways of, of, of working. You know, is, do you, do you, how, how you see this complementarity? You know, and, and particularly how, how we can uh, address or use this complementarity to, to, to reach uh, uh, beyond the, the, the standard cognitive sensory uh, perceptions of the world and turn them into something advanced, spiritual, intuitive, and, 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 and all these things you, are, you were also telling us about. Well, um, I mean, that, that could be really long, but I, I'm thinking in general, what I feel is like, whenever I talk to anybody that works in, the, in science or the conservation sector, there are people that actually love the planet. They love it, but it's hard for people to bring this into some spheres of society that have disregarded all these feminine qualities uh, and more towards the masculine qualities. And I think that's that's one of the biggest problems that we have, uh, mistakes that we have done. Because you see also when you think about um, societies that live more in balance with nature, they had all these spiritual or ethical or empathic elements uh, influencing their decision making. And, um, and again, it's about the whole. And you have a lot of societies talking about this, how can we become whole again? And that whole is like, like uh, how Jordi showed, like the two ways of looking at a problem it's complementary so you can look at the details with an analytical mind but if you miss to see the connections between those you you're just just seeing half of the picture so i really think it's complementary and and i really think that it starts with us like how do we find courage to bring our wholeness into our lives how can you bring that love that everyone probably in this webinar has and this connection to the ocean into their actually their actual decision making and the and the projects and to talk about these things in meetings and to bring everything you know if you want to cry about all the dead fish that's okay and that should be one of the drivers for you to make a decision like that passion that you feel so so i think that um that the other problem is that we science kind of made us think that one there is one solution that applies to everything like there's one best solution and that one way of breaking free from that one size fits all problem that we know that it doesn't we know that that approach doesn't work uh, is to really share that power so really try to decolonize our perspectives. Sadly, Western type of science is like that overarching paradigm. But I think it's not for me to say what is the solution for this, but for each little community to be like, okay, what works for us? What is meaningful for us? What is meaningful for our community? And, uh, and yeah, and understand that Western science is just one limited worldview. And it can be complementary, yeah. So, so, uh, so, and there's a book about this that I love that it's called Designs for the Pluriverse by Arturo Escobar. He's a scholar from the United States. And it summarizes this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela. Yeah, certainly, probably the most important and less studied science is the science of happiness, no? All, yeah. everything should go in that direction. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the challenge, you know? I don't know if you want to add something, uh, Tom, Jordi? 
No, uh, that, that's fine. I, I very much agree with what uh, Gabriela was saying. And, and I, I know the book by, by Arturo, he's a friend as well. And yes, I, I can recommend it too. Maybe we should um, move on to the questions by the participants. Yeah, well, one, one, one very last question for, yeah, for, uh, for Jordi. Okay. And probably if you want to be very brief, you probably have touched already on that, no? Uh, the, that that uh, you already told us not that 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 uh, uh, that our experience of nature is not di only digital, not because there there, there are, and, and probably some of you have already experienced this, no? That that seems that uh, this idea that everything will be in the future inside a computer, even even ourselves can be, and and some people do believe this, no? That 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 yourself, you you your own self. Will be transferred to to a computer and and uh, and then then uh, uh, all these these uh, uh, thoughts certainly uh, uh, can uh, uh, can mislead people. No? What what do you feel about that? Um, yes, um, Tom showed us these uh, statistics about how individualism is on the rise, and I think it's quite. Um, obvious that if individualism is on the rise, connection with nature globally is going down because individualism uh, shuts us more and more into our own um, individual uh, bubble. Uh, in relation to this and, with, um, and in relation to this idea of the exchange of digital information you were talking about, one step forward in this um, disconnecting ourselves from nature is so-called virtual reality. So, so many millions of people have the aspiration of living in a virtual bubble in which they will keep uh, breathing the air that the biosphere provides and drinking the water that, that is provided by the biosphere, but they will believe that they are in a completely different world. This is an extreme of disconnection, and, and that's partly why it's so important to, uh, to transform completely our mindsets, see what is it that is drawing us to this kind of artificial labyrinth of virtual realities and so on, and find ways of reconnecting ourselves with nature. And I agree with um, Gabriela that here there is no one solution. There are many, many solutions related to um, uh, all cultures, who you are, what are your, 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 your feelings, your relations, your connections, what is the time and so on. So I think we all should um, find our ways to reconnect more with nature and, and, and with ourselves. Um, and maybe I, I, I should make my, my, my little um, uh, caveat with, with the idea of um, Tom that uh, self is a delusion. Of course, uh, yes, I, I very much agree that the self is a delusion. If we agree that also plants and rocks are uh, not individual selves, because they are also part of a flow. And, and that's the Buddhist understanding of um, Pratidya Samutpada, of uh, complete interdependence of everything that, 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 that appears. Um, so even the sun is just a moment in the history of the universe. Um, there is nothing that is completely self-subsisting by itself. All is related to other things. And in that sense, um, everything uh, is related to other things. Nothing is an isolated substance. So yes, it's very important to realize that um, a um, solidified sense of self is an illusion. We are not billiard balls mm, crashing against each other to see which one is more powerful. Using an, a, a C metaphor, I would say that our individuality is more like that of the waves of an ocean. Uh, you oceanographers will know that oceans are never, um, sorry, waves are never identical. They may have uh, more salinity, more plankton, more uh, whatever components. Um, but uh, so I, I believe that uh, every person is a wave in the in the collective ocean of, of, of the mind. And of course, we are all unique. And this is beautiful that we are all unique. And that's why we can do sessions like this one. And I, I, I thank you again for the opportunity of doing this. But um, we are all part of the same ocean. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jordi. So we move to the questions from the from the audience. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, remind the audience that we, the, we are doing these webinars, Euromarine is doing these webinars, because uh, it's searching for a, a future strategy for, for, for its partners. Uh, Marina is the largest partnership of uh, uh, European uh, research marine centers. 
is uh, trying to develop a strategy and a manifesto for the future where, where we want to go as a community of scientists that are deeply involved and deeply uh, concern on, on on how things uh, uh, will evolve. No, so so these questions will be will be certainly taken into account in in this in this future thought, this future manifesto. So 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 we we do appreciate all of them, and 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 now we don't have time to go over all of them, but uh, at, at least I will go to to a few of them, the ones that have uh, had more support. The first one was by Tatiana uh, Valeta. She asks uh, uh, for Tom, she says, how do you see anthropocentrism has influenced the scientific method and the way we gather data from the natural world? Is there a space for doing science and studying biodiversity in a way that builds off a human nature connection and immersing ourselves in an environment instead of seeing humans exclusively as separate objective uh, observers? How, how, how do we participate and how do this participation we involve the scientific method? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's a really great question. Um, and I think th this idea that, you know, the scientific process is, is kind of devoid, separate from kind of our values is, is you know, not, not true. And, and uh, you know, I think the writings in post-normal science where they really demonstrate how values kind of permeate our scientific process, I think it's important. Uh, so this question about, you know, how does changing our world, worldview change the way we do science, I think it is really important. I mean, y y looking backwards in biology, there's a big focus, obviously, on kind of reductionism and competition between elements. So you see, you know, the kind of idea of the selfish gene and uh, we are just this, you know, lumbering robots and our genes of kind of working against each other competing. But actually now there's been a real shift over the last, you know, recent decades towards a greater focus on processes of more holistic approaches of and and the, the focus on cooperation and, and symbiosis and mutualism is definitely in sort of even pure biology tech starting to to kind of move out. And I think that's a hopefully a shift to um to thinking about relationships between parts and the kind of systems approach rather than the kind of classic reductionism. So I think there's a trend there. I think in terms of how we treat you know what does nature do for us people can come at it from a very kind of ecosystem services instrumental perspective um and if you think about kind of say maslow's hierarchy of needs about you know um the the, the basic needs of humanity we have security at the bottom so it's not to say that, that this view is not important you know that um ecosystem services could be seen as sort of operating at that bottom level of maslow's hierarchy but at the top level, we have kind of self-transcendence and, and these higher values. And so the role of biodiversity as kind of more spiritual aspects of, of our connection with nature, I think, fit very well. And so when we talk to people, we don't have to polarize the argument and say, well, you're just, you know, you're just all about the instrumental value of nature. I think we can kind of see that actually, you know, um, there's different ways of looking at nature that can be reconciled there. And it's obviously not all about instrumental values. And I think taking a more biocentric perspective um, is interesting. And there's quite a few approaches where, you know, like a council of all beings where, for example, uh, participants asked to kind of take a perspective of a different species. And when we make decisions about, about you know, society and the natural world, we're not doing it from a very, only an anthropocentric perspective. We're at least trying to kind of think about those other species. So I think there's quite interesting approaches that are just in their infancy for how we incorporate those biocentric worldviews into how we make decisions. I'll stop there, yeah, because it's a big topic, but the others might want to comment. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, another another question that uh, uh, was addressed to you uh, is uh, from uh, from Eleni Vintodi. She says, uh, your presentation finished with the solution is within us. Uh, but is it or is it the point of view, to, uh, this point of view too individualistic? Should we look more carefully into the ways the current political system works and works within us yeah yeah i, I think um uh of course that our, our the way you know our society and our kind of culture influences how our world views and vice versa our world views obviously combined form those institutions so there is a it's you can't unpick it's sort of chicken and egg in terms of the relationship between us and our political systems that influence our thinking etc so I think um, in that sense, it, it's right. I think if we see that there is a problem, um, then we are both 
you know, inside us is the kind of cause and the solution uh, to those to those issues. And um, so, I, yeah, I think, at the, of course, we could say there is no problem. Ultimately, hum humanity will go extinct and, and life will continue. And not life is not a threat here, obviously. You know, life on this planet will continue. So you could take a very, you know, uh, uncentered decentered philosophical perspective and say there is no problem but i think if we say there is a problem because we care about humanity and we care about other species then we can say that you know that problem is driven by ultimately how we think and how how we we act in the world and so the solutions i, I lie uh, also there so i think it, it's a fair point and actually i just uh jordy mentioned ralph Waldo emerson and there's another quote that he has how um, he says, how, observe how every truth and every error, each a thought of some man's mind, clothes itself with societies, houses, cities, languages, ceremonies, newspapers. How timber, brick, lime and stone have flown into the convenient shape, obedient to the master idea right, reigning in the mind of many persons. And I think I love that because it's this idea that all those things in the world that are out there are actually kind of um, coming from within us and our institutions kind of flow from from how we we think and how we act. But uh, yeah, I'm sure the others have got thoughts, maybe. Thank, thanks so much. We have, we'll take another couple of questions. One from Joao uh, Rodriguez uh, uh, that is addressed to the three of you. So so perhaps Gabriela and Jordi can, can respond. Uh, thank you very much for your insightful uh, presentations. My question is about power and politics in shaping narratives, beliefs and attitudes towards nature and sustainability or unsustainability. You know? In your view, how should we approach power dynamics and politics in sustainable sustainability research? Perhaps, Gabriela, you want to, to answer this question? Or... Uh, I think we have to fight <laughs> back. I, I know that many times when we talk about all these problems, you know, we, we get rooms full, full of scientists and we're in this conference and we're all on the same side. And the problem is actually political. It's not technical. We have the technology and and, and we have the, the human power for everything. But um, it's like if we if we have very few people making decisions for the rest of us and mostly looking for the... Um, profits for corporations like we we are fighting these giant 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 machines of destroying the earth and i think that the way to do it it's like vote properly set boundaries and that starts in academia like i would have never gotten funding for the project that i have now in in argentina sadly um, and it made sense here in new zealand because of the situation with indigenous peoples that it's quite unique in the world. So, so I think that it's really, yeah, about voting, about speaking up, about being vulnerable, about having... So I also had a, a situation in my university and, and the way that we are solving it is to actually have those really courageous conversations that we need to have with all the fear that comes from stigma and from having problems and, and being prosecuted for your way of thinking. Um, but we do, we do activism in that. We do activism in the way that we publish in the papers, types of papers and journals that we try to publish that are not like the top ones, but that are more inclusive with other types of worldviews. Um, and we do find strength in community. So I find strength with my colleagues I'm really, I love them. They're my good friends. And sometimes we find somebody that tries to take out our funding because we're not doing what it's expected from them or from the mainstream type of research. And we just try to stick together and, and we find that power in unity. But um, little by little, yeah, that's my personal experience. Thank Jordi? you very much, Gabriela. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Um, I agree with that. Uh, about uh, power and politics, uh, I realized that, that when I make this distinction between what I call the algorithmic mind and the holistic self, I forgot to mention a very important point, which is that the algorithmic mind is very much related to control and power. Mm -hmm. The worldview that has been our um, mainstream uh, view in the last centuries of reducing the world to objects is very much related to uh, willingness to um, control manipulate 
um, that um, is at the root of uh, capitalism or today's techno capitalism. So uh, as long as we um, basically sit in this uh, mindset, in this algorithmic mind, this by itself is very much related to, to a view of the world that sees not only nature, but other human beings and everything as um, commodifiable products to, to dominate, to control, and so on. And then um, building on, the, on this idea of uh, Aotearoa, of, of, of um, giving personhood to uh, some rivers and some mountains, right? Um, as is happening um, lately in, in, in Aotearoa and New Zealand. Um, Gabriela said she's a very spiritual person. And I believe that, yes, um, we very much need a more spiritual um, uh, connection. And uh, as long as we don't have a spiritual connection, our, our knowledge and our science are going to be somehow um, missing something very important. So I, I would invite also to develop um, everyone uh, their own spiritual connection, the, the one that fits them best. Thank you very much, Jordi and Gabriela. Yes, certainly, we have to speak loud these these words, no? These words of uh, empathy, these words of ha happiness, no? That sometimes seem to be so far away of the scientific narrative, no? Because the, it's it's we have to realize that everything is is connected, as you you all have been explaining, and 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 this is. Uh, this is uh, one one task for us all, no? as Tom was also saying. You know, when we get a, 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 a critical mass of people thinking the same thing, then it it just spreads naturally, it spreads, and 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 we all resonate. No, we are resonating, and this uh, resonance is what elevates the, the entire thing. So, uh, and last question, I think we could be here all day talking because it's been so wonderful and. And uh, I'll take this last question of philosophy and address it first to, to Jordi. Uh, uh, Chris Wilmot uh, uh, says, uh, because terrestrial philosophy is not the same as undersea philosophy, we need a philosophy of where the terrestrial meets the sea, where the oceans on the rise flood coastal cities, where we are submerged uh, philosophically. So, so he asks us for this, this permeability, I would say, no, between the, the, the cities and uh, where we live as humankind and, and the, the, the ocean, the urban ocean and the entire ocean around us. I, perhaps you can. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I never heard of this idea of um, undersea philosophy, and I find it very suggestive, actually. Um, and one could say that um, terrestrial philosophy um, if it follows um, the, the model of the earth, made of mountains and stones and so on, we'll focus more on what is static and more or less apparently isolated. Whereas um, an ocean philosophy would be much more based on, on flow, which is how we actually realize the world is. Like um, quantum physics shows us that the world is intrinsically um, dynamic, much more than we ever thought. But also the idea of undersea philosophy um, suggests to me um, going to the very, very depth of things. Like actually with this uh, idea, this image of the iceberg that uh, Gabriela was showing, right? Going, um, not just um, staying on the surface, uh, and actually Tom, Tom was making the same point that we um, often uh, remain at the surface and don't look at the mindset of what is at the very depth of things. So, uh, and the sea philosophy would be a nice um, expression to sum it up. Thank you. Can I can I add something? Yes, I know please. that we have to go, but yes, I, I I've seen many questions from Chris and I've been answering them and I feel and again this is not rigorous or anything, but there's a lot of authors that talk about the feminine and the masculine, uh -huh. and definitely the sea is related to the unconscious mind, to the dark, dark in the sense that there's no light shed on the unconscious. And it's, it's so hard to control and to understand. It's not like the sun and the earth that it's outside, that it's seen by our senses. So I really, I really believe that when you look at deep ecology and you see feminist theories, feminism again has a lot of different angles and shades. 
but in the sense of all these things that we cannot control that are part of us, that are more emotional, that are more, um, yeah, like hard to understand are, are the biggest challenge that we face, men and women. So go into that darkness, <laughs> like we must go into that darkness, that area that's unconscious of ourselves as society and and delve into those realms of things that are actually really like a lot harder to grasp that but we all carry inside us and we all feel and again feminine you have that feminine part even if you are identified as a man um and i think really it's about healing all that part within us that will help us heal it outside of us and i've seen this process for example in my husband very latin american macho type of guy and how parenthood changed him and how his feminine came up and that nurturing, caring, patient person that came up. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of writers that relate all this, the ocean definitely to be feminine, to be guided by the moon and with all these forces and all this strength. And it has the feminine has that caring part, but then it has this super strong, really scary, dark part. And if we integrate it within us, then we can actually start healing it on the outside. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Uh, could we take that as your wrap up? Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, or you want to ask oh, something I'd love else? That. We give uh, one minute to Tom and one minute to Jordi. Or you want to? Yes, because that, that, that was beautiful. Yes, certainly. I think there is nothing to add. No, not on your side, Jordi. I'm certain that you could be telling us many things, but thanks, thanks for for uh, for closing. And and uh, Tom, you want to add something? Uh, no, no. I think that was a, a good place to add. I just want maybe one thing because there was a question that was that was open um, about awe, and I think it, it relates to this experience of nature because there's there's lots of experiments now that show that when people sense, feel a sense of awe, and whether that's from the vastness of something of a scale, but it sets us as individuals in a different context. And, and there's some nice research showing that how that reduces our kind of strength of our atomistic ego and, and makes people feel a, a greater sense of kind of oneness, similar mechanism that happens in meditation and in psychedelic experiences. So I think this idea of being in nature and really learning from it is kind of a clear pathway from to actually feeling differently about our relationship to others and nature. And then obviously we can maybe carry that through in our day-to-day -day business and our work. Um. Okay, so I think that this is it. Thanks thanks so much. And thanks very much to the speakers. This has been wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, to the audience. We, we've had uh, 100 people listening at some point and still have over 60 people after two hours of, of uh, talk and, and, and exchange. And please look forward to our uh, coming seminars. They, they, they'll be webinars that they'll be with December disruptive, transformative and challenging view. We don't want to talk about what we already know. We want to, to explore different, different ways, different uh, pathways. Yeah. So thanks again, everybody. And, uh, and uh, see you uh, next month. Bye-bye.